Hello to everybody. I've chosen a topic that I hope you'll find interesting, um, a sort of overview of the, the role of emotions in language teaching and learning. So uh, I, th I chose this topic because it's a bit neglected uh, in the literature, but one I think that um, resonates with all of us because um, teaching and learning a second language are both emotionally charged activities, I guess. So emotions play an important role in uh, teaching because teaching is not only a, a cognitive or a rational activity, it's uh, it, a social activity. It takes place in a social sp space, that is the classroom, uh, where emotions um, play a role. They come and go. And they can influence both the way the teachers teach as well as the way learners learn. Uh, so learning to teach means not only mastering how to uh, to use the methods of teaching, how to communicate subject matter, but also how to manage the emotional dimensions of teaching and learning. So emotions, as one uh, researcher has said, are part of the very fabric that constitutes the teacher self. And um, as emotional practitioners, teachers can decide really how much emotions to put into their classrooms and strong emotions may motivate a teacher to take actions that he or she would not normally perform. There has been a renewed focus on emotions in the language teaching field and um, research looking at learning from the viewpoint of the participants in the social space of the classroom, that is teachers and learners of course, and how they um, experience uh, how they experience the subjective realities that they encounter in the classroom and more generally the introduction of positive psychology in applied linguistics has broadened our understanding of the range of emotions that teachers and learners experience particularly the role that um, positive emotions can play in facilitating teaching and learning uh, looking back at how emotions have been dealt with, uh, in my recollection of the way the field has developed uh, over the years, uh, traditionally I guess they were part of what we call affective factors, features that have often received fairly limited attention in mainstream applied linguistics due to the emphasis on the more uh, cognitive processes, if you like, in SLA. and. Sometimes emotions were viewed as something kind of fuzzy and difficult to research, to tease apart, um, sort of soft, if you like, and irrational in comparison to the so-called hard, quantifiable, and rational facts about second language learning and teaching that were the focus of much of the research when I really got into this field. But there has been uh, what some people call an affective turn in applied linguistics that's prompted a re-examination of the role of affective factors in language learning and teaching. And so this has led to a focus not so much on what emotions are, but on how they affect language teaching and learning. So, they're nowadays regarded, if you like, as a socio-cultural experience, primarily determined by the individual characteristics, but by relationships and social contexts. Not merely then something that we have, but something that we do. So what I'd like to do today is to present a brief overview of emotions in our field, in TESOL, by looking at emotions as they relate to the experience of teachers, then of second language learners, and lastly, teacher learners, student teachers. And I'm going to focus on three or four questions. Firstly, uh, what sort of emotions do language teachers, language learners, and teacher learners experience in their different roles in the classrooms? What circumstances prompt these emotions? Um, how do they affect the process of teaching and learning? So that's the way the talk is going to be structured in three related sections. So I want to start with the first one, emotions and the teacher. How emotions um, shape what teachers do and how teachers feel. 
perhaps I should try to start with an, a, a definition of emotions because they are uh, rather fuzzy things to try to pin down. Here's a definition that I took from the literature. Emotions are short-lived feeling arousal, purposive, expressive phenomena that help us adapt to the opportunities and challenges that we face during important life events. Quite a mouthful, I'm afraid. Um, for teachers, the experience of teaching, of course, involves both positive and negative emotions. We've all had pleasant experiences in teaching, and we've often also had unpleasant experiences. And positive emotional experiences include situations where we feel confident, curious, enthusiastic, happy, passionate, satisfied, hopefully more of our classroom experiences are of this kind, but also there are negative emotions, and they, and they might be such things as when we feel angry, anxious, bored, depressed, nervous, worried, and so on. So when we experience these kinds of emotions, they are the outcome of interactions between the teacher and his or her teaching context. And they include feelings we have about ourselves, our colleagues, our learners, classroom activities, the teaching context, and so on, as well as feelings we may have as teachers about the benefits and rewards as well as challenges of teaching. So why are these important to think about? Well, because emotions can influence the teacher's decision-making and action. So they, they play a, a role, they have an impact on what we do, for they can affect the use of English, when the teacher chooses to use English or not, the, the way the teacher interacts with students, how she or he responds to anticipated classroom situations. They can affect the rules and procedures we make use of. Um, the t extent to which the teacher makes use of activities that address classroom climate, how, how, the, how the class, the atmosphere, if you like, of the class. And of course, they can influence the choice of colleagues that we may choose to work with in activities such as team teaching and peer observation. Also, the kind of feedback we give, whether we prefer group-based as opposed to teacher-dominated activities, and so on. So, there's a great deal of uh, ways, different ways, in which emotional factors shape the way we teach. And I like the term emotional competence, which uh, has been used to refer to the ability of the teacher to develop and maintain an emotionally managed classroom, emotional competence. One where there's neither too much nor too little emotion, on either the part of the teachers or students. Neither teachers nor students are encouraged to display negative emotions. As teachers, we're never supposed to, we're never supposed to show anger, for example, boredom or anxiety. But of course, different contexts, different uh, situations for teaching can create either what you might call favoring circumstances or disfavoring circumstances for teaching and, and that can influence our emotional experience of teaching. Um, favorable contexts of course include motivated students, small class size, good uh, facilities, skilled and supportive administrators who are open to new ideas, um, a collaborative School culture, good compensation always helps, doesn't it? Uh, well paid. Uh, disfavorable conditions, on the other hand, can lead to teacher stress. And these would include a large class size, for example, emphasis on book learning, where all the teacher does is present information from the book and test, for example. Um, so, substandard facilities can also uh, lower teachers' emotional commitment and enjoyment from teaching. So, in many situations, factors such as these can create a negative emotional experience of teaching, preventing teachers from realizing what you might call your aspirational identity, that is, the, the kind of teacher you would like to be. It can lead to feelings of frustration and disappointment or even anger. One source of uh, 
emotions, of course, ha have to do with confidence and having uh, the, a confident grasp of the subject matter, how much we know about teaching, and not having a confident grasp of uh, one subject, not knowing enough about grammar, not knowing enough about discourse or vocabulary or pronunciation, for example, can lead a teacher to feel unsure about his or her identity, can lead to feelings of frustration and guilt since perhaps the teacher doesn't feel confident in answering the sort of questions student, uh, students may pose. And for some teachers, negative experiences of this kind can cause attempts to suppress or hide negative emotions. For others, it may lead to uh, looking for opportunities to further one's professional knowledge through taking coursework, collaborating with colleagues, um, taking part in activities like peer observation or joining some sort of online support group. Teaching as a source of positive uh, emotions, of course, is something that we, we look forward to. And for many people, teaching is a source of positive emotions and experience. And these sustain their interest and their commitment to teaching throughout their careers. What sort of positive emotions do you get from teaching, for example? Well, these would include, for example, the warmth and affection we get from students or through relationship with students, seeing the progress that they make, um, the positive response which we get from helping learners uh, succeed and developing an awareness of how they can improve their learning of English and helping them manage their ability to learn. These are all a source of positive emotions and managing the emotional dimensions of teaching and learning depends both on the teacher's individual qualities. What sort of teacher are you? Are you extroverted, introverted, outgoing, you know, and so on. And um, as well as being aware of some of the options that are available to teachers. Positive interactions with colleagues and with the ESL professional community can be a source of emotional strength and, in, and reinforcement. And it's, the reason why teachers like to go to conferences such as this one, so that they can interact with other, other colleagues and be affirmed, if you like, in their uh, commitment to teaching. So, of course, effective teachers have different ways of creating an emotionally supported class. What can you do to build positive emotions into the classroom where there's a climate of uh, collaboration and sharing? opportunities for students to experience positive emotions and for students to be willing to take risks. So the emotional climate of the classroom will depend on how the teacher sees his or her role, how he or she interacts with students and builds rapport with students and colleagues. It, it has to do with uh, the responsibilities students have during a lesson, um, the kinds of materials and resources and activities that the uh, teacher makes use of. One example uh, of support for an emotionally supportive classroom is the teacher's use of humor, and that's something I try to use a lot in my own teaching. We, we, I like to establish the idea that the, the class can be fun, even though it's serious, it can be fun at the same time. And um, my colleague in Australia, Rose Senior, looked at the role of humour and how it can establish the maintenance of class cohesion, the sense of um, bonding of the class, uh, forming a community, if, if you like. And she found that um, there were a lot of benefits that came from using humour during teaching. It helped students relax, it helped them become more willing to take part in lessons, giving them greater confidence, increasing their motivation, and so on. And she also looked at um, how large classes with many students function when the students are working as groups and uh, where there's a spirit of cohesion, if you like, uh, and collaboration, an important feature of an emotionally supportive classroom. Okay, so th those are some of the ways that uh, emotions influence teachers. I want in the second part of this talk to look at emotions now from the point of view of the language learner. 
So I think it was uh, Jane Arnold who said that an effectively positive environment puts the brain in the optimal state for learning, minimal stress and maximum engagement with the material to be learned. So what sort of emotions do learners experience and how do these influence their teach their learning? Well, for learners, emotions include feelings about themselves, about their teachers, do they like their teachers, about other students, do they get on with them, how do they feel about using English in class, about the teacher's command of English and his or her teaching ability. So one can compare, for example, the different emotions that arise with different kinds of classroom activities. For example, or, or, or different kinds of situations. Um, f and for example, how would you compare using English with a native speaker versus using English with a non-native speaker? Uh, how do students feel about performing fluency activities as opposed to accuracy-based activities? How do they feel about performing a spoken activity in front of the class? Or getting feedback from the teacher as opposed from other learners? or getting feedback publicly or privately, in other words, when the teacher talks to the student after class. How do they feel about using English with classmates rather than using English in an online chat room? So these different kinds of experiences uh, elicit different emotions. So for this reason, for learners, they are considered the driving force of motivation in second language learning. And the research from people like Diwali and um, Donier, for example, argue that positive emotions encourage uh, curiosity, risk-taking, experimenting, willingness to interact and communicate in the new language, and they support autonomous or independent learning. They can motivate learners when they lead to feelings of success and also enhance the learner's sense of self-esteem, making them willing to invest further in learning. Because if a student, of course, is discouraged and doesn't feel he or she is making any progress, feels depressed or negative about learning, he or she will not make use of possible opportunities available through the media or the internet or through opportunities to use their English out of class. So in what we could call an emotionally managed classrooms, uh, teachers anticipate the emotions that language learning involves, and they look for ways of helping students cope with the negative emotions that are about, uh, bound to arise from time to time in, uh, in the classroom. Because negative emotions can uh, demotivate learners due to a sense of frustration and disappointment when learners fail to achieve their goals. Uh, of course, Students often have unrealistic goals. They expect that language learning is going to be a lot easier than it is and occur much more quickly than it will do. So learners can experience a range of negative emotions in classroom-based language learning. These include, for example, fear of being laughed at by their peers, fear of being negatively evaluated by teachers, fear of embarrassment, um, concern that others in the class may be more proficient, hesitant to perform in front of the class, uh, frustration by lack of uh, appropriate vocabulary or grammar, or inability to pronounce words and so on, and frustration by not being able to express what they wanted to say. So, of course, some students respond to these uh, negative feelings by trying to seat themselves out of the teacher's range, out of the action zone, if you like, sitting perhaps at the back of the classroom where they're not likely to meet the teacher's gaze. Um, apart from studies of language anxiety in the, in the applied linguistics literature, emotions in the language classroom have received relatively little attention until fairly recently. So there has been a lot more uh, research on students' emotions by researchers. I read a number of interesting studies recently from researchers in different parts of the world, many of them teachers, looking at the, ex exper the emotions that students experience during their English classes. For example, a study at one 
Mexican university that I looked at recently, students kept a journal of their positive and negative emotions and the source of these emotions throughout a 12-week language course. The commonest emotions were things like fear, happiness, worry, calmness, sadness, and excitement. And although these feelings were prompted by a number of sources, the most frequently cited sources were insecurity about their speaking ability, the teacher's attitudes, comparisons with peers, the classroom atmosphere, and the type of learning activities that they made use of. So that particular piece of research identified specific uh, things that caused negative mo emotions in the progress of learning a, a, a language. So the public setting of a language classroom also poses particular issues related to self-image, to face and identity. And for example, research on the emotions prompted by speaking activities, public speaking activities in a language classroom um, included, f for example, um, fear of performing in front of the class, uh, worried about being called out, fear of not being able to perform well, um, anxiously waiting for a turn to speak, loss of confidence while speaking. Um, the learners were afraid to volunteer answers. They were f worried about forgetting what they'd prepared and so on. And the afraid of the teacher correcting their mistakes. So these kinds of common uh, responses to having to speak aloud, having to speak out during a speaking class prompted um, a whole variety of concerns and negative emotions. Of course, some of these uh, fears may reflect individual differences that, uh, based on age or gender or personality or self-confidence or previous learning experience and so on. And some may be related to cultural factors. So in some cultures, students may be more willing to communicate in front of their peers in the classroom than in other cultures. This has been remarked, of course, uh, in research in China, suggesting that in China, group cohesiveness and attachment to group members influence Chinese students' willingness to communicate in the classroom. So a student may believe that if he or she speaks up in class, this may not be valued by other students since it's judged to be sort of showing off and an attempt to make other students look weak. In other contexts, uh, students in Iran, for example, have reported, studies have reported that an overemphasis by the teacher on achieving a native like North American use of grammar and pronunciation has, can cause anxiety among learners. They feel they're not able to achieve the teacher's standard. So the teacher's role is um, a sort of an authority figure who monitors students' language use rather than as a facilitator. Another response to negative emotions is silence. Um, and this is a, can be a response to em embarrassment, frustration, annoyance, or anxiety, which may be viewed by the teacher as a refusal to cooperate and, in a sense, viewed perhaps negatively. But for the learner, silence may be a way of managing emotions. It can serve as a face-saving strategy, since others in the class can no longer judge the learner's language ability. Now, whereas communication in the classroom in front of peers and the teacher can be stressful for many learners, making them perhaps unwilling to communicate, other contexts can create less of an emotional challenge for learners. And research on chat room communication, for example, suggests that it provides better emotional support for using English than the classroom often does. It's a stress-free context because no one is evaluating the learner when they're using English in a chat room. They're not handicapped by their limited English proficiency or fear of making mistakes. So consequently, chat room interactions often result, interestingly, in more successful comprehension as well as a greater quantity of target language production than um, classroom-based communication. So, teachers obviously have to invest a considerable amount of emotional guidance to support learners' attempts to use English in the classroom. 
and uh, supporting students' emotions in language learning classrooms can help students cope with the feelings inherent in language learning experiences and to the development of a teacher training, uh, of a positive attitude towards themselves as language learners. Looking through teacher training textbooks and online resources, I found a number of useful suggestions for teachers who, who seek to achieve an emotionally supportive classroom climate. For example, introducing the notion of anxiety and discussing it in the classroom. Um, helping teachers recognize signs of negative emotions and strategies to respond to negative emotions. Emphasizing the importance of an emotionally supportive classroom climate and how it can be developed. Uh, encouraging collaboration rather than competition among learners. Encouraging learners to try to use the language they've learned without worrying too much about accuracy. And having students share learning experiences where emotions were involved and discuss how they responded to them. And of course, making use of activities that students can enjoy and accomplish and which give them a feeling of success and satisfaction. Not giving activities that are too difficult. So those are some thoughts about the role of emotions from the point of view of the language learner. Now, lastly, I'd like to look at the effect of emotions on student teachers, on, t uh, on young people who are learning to be become English language teachers. And emotions can play an important role in t teacher learning, both in the experience of novice teachers, for example, completing um, coursework or a teaching practic practicum, or also for experienced teachers returning to campus to complete a postgraduate degree or diploma. So teacher development has been described as an emotionally charged process, one in which there's sometimes what we call emotional dissonance or disconnection, if you like. That is a, um, a gap between the identity that the teacher would like to aspire to and what he or she finds she is obliged to carry out in the classroom in the context in which she or he is working. So for example, the school not, may not provide the, the right context for the student teacher to realize the kind of teacher they would like to be. And this because of uh, uh, the school culture or class size or, or whatever. So this uh, often happens and can lead to frustration and uh, negative emotions. So in the master's course or in an undergraduate course, teachers may be introduced to current theories of what makes a good lesson, features of good practice and so on. But um, they may find that in the classroom, these are not, uh, the, the conditions do not allow these beliefs to be realized. So student teachers experience a variety of emotions during their teacher development courses, as those of you who are teacher trainers will, of course, um, be familiar with. Depending on the context for learning as well as the activities that the student teachers are uh, engaged in. So a teaching practicum, for example, will present a test of student teachers' ability to apply what they've studied and whether they'll be accepted as a competent teacher by the students that they're teaching or by their supervisor. They may find that they're actually unprepared for some of the issues that arise in their, in their practice teaching, challenging their uh, use of English even and their ability to realize their identity as a teacher. So this can, can lead to emotional stress, particularly when you have, a, for example, a graduate course con consisting of a mix of um, native speaker students as well as non-native uh, teachers of English. And the um, limitations in the student teacher's English proficiency may impede their participation in some of the activities that um, typically occur in a graduate teacher education program. So um, a study I looked at recently from an Indonesian scholar, Zacharias, looked at three Indonesian English teachers participating in a US graduate TESOL program. 
and it revealed some of the emotional challenges that the teachers faced as they negotiated their participation in the classroom during the course. And one issue was their sensitivity to their status as non-native speakers of English. Rather than accepting this as a deficit during the course, the participants managed their emotional response to their status in a variety of ways. For example, by becoming more active participants in classroom discussions rather than being seen as restricted by their non-native speaker status. Perhaps by repositioning themselves as multilinguals, emphasizing their multilingual ability in comparison to the fact that many of their monolingual classmates only spoke English, by also developing an awareness of themselves as producers and not merely consumers of knowledge, emphasizing their ability to add to the knowledge base rather than just be um, recipients of it. Um, a colleague in Hong Kong looked at emotions experienced by six pre-service teachers completing a practicum in an English teacher education program in, in mainland China and he documented the emergence of five types of emotions among the student teachers. They were anxiety, which was resulted from several different courses, including issues with classroom management. Um, disappointment, the realization that they were considered outsiders with little agency or autonomy and no opportunity to change things. Uh, doubt, they experienced doubts about their teaching ability or their potential due to concerns over their language proficiency and their classroom management skills. Disillusionment, they felt that their opinions were not needed or respected since they were just treated as temporary classroom assistants, while the mentor was the only real teacher in the classroom. However, they did also experience joy, positive experiences, particularly when they received warm encouragement from their students. And this kind of recognition helped them manage their negative emotions as, as well as contributed to the development of their teacher identity. So studies such as this um, demonstrate the need for a practicum course to include activities that help novice teachers develop emotional competence, the ability to, to uh, anticipate and prepare for incidents that they might experience during their practicum and how to manage emotions that may arise. And these kinds of issues are often not addressed in a teaching practicum course, which more often focuses on professional knowledge and teaching methods rather than how to manage and respond to some of the complex issues that arise in uh, student teaching practice. So just to draw this uh, to, a, to a conclusion, I've um, suggested that there's a need for the study of emotions to have a more central position in theory, research, and practice in our field. The understanding and management of emotions are an important dimension of teachers' knowledge and ability. While for learners, emotions are crucial to how they navigate and process their learning. So in teacher educational courses, teacher emotional awareness and emotional competence can be the focus of procedures that we use, such as peer observation, journal writing, critical incident analysis, role plays, case studies, and so on. And for language learners, rather than being a hidden dimension of successful learning, emotions can be brought to the forefront through the use of activities that encourage learners to reflect on their on the role that emotions play in their own language learning and in their responses to the emotional demands of learning and using English. So thank you for listening and I wish you all the best in your explorations of what it means to be an effective teacher and an effective manager of the emotional competence, the emotional climate of your own classrooms.